me. Do I sound like I'm on it all? I can always yell and scream and holler, but I already did enough of that in Oaxaca. So, well, greetings from Oaxaca City, Guerreros. Guerreros. Does anybody know what that word means? Warriors. This is a gift that Joe Hendricksman and Amy gave to me. Uh, would have given it to Randy, but then Randy had a different gift. So praise the Lord. Thank you, Randy, for being so kind. And uh, you had the right size for me. This probably would have been too big for you. But he uh, got me a double X, and I fill it out well, I think. But, uh, yeah, there's uh, some hummingbirds on there. Now, see, they're the warriors with hummingbirds. Pretty cool. But uh, greetings again from Joe and Amy and uh, uh, from Watu, 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 no, that's, no, 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 Paloma would be mad at me right now. Watulco, you can hear Paloma right there, right? No. Watulco, Oaxaca, Mexico. That's where we were exactly. We were in Oaxaca, of course, a, a missions team from your church went off and uh, a few of us uh, made it back. No, all of us made it back. And uh, we had quite a time um, in the Lord. We did a sports camp in a little uh, community uh, with some uh, children that were just beautiful in the Lord. And uh, children, many of them live on the streets. Many of them uh, ride around at 10 years old on a motorbike and that's how they get around. Many of them don't have a mom or don't have a dad or they have don't have both. And uh, this is a neat little area that Joe and Amy have uh, been directed by the Lord to start another work. And they started it uh, about a year or two, two ago, I believe, just kind of got the church plant started. And now it's really going to launch. They, they actually had the roof poured <laughs> of the mission trip while we were there. And you as a church contributed to that. We also... Uh, Played with the bouncy house on Friday. You as a church gave money to that as well. Joe and Amy were at our church in October of 2016, and about five or six weeks later, they were on a plane off to Oaxaca, and they have been on the mission field since then. They came back one time for a short stay, and we had them on a Wednesday night here. That had to be three years ago. Randy and I and both of our incredible memories couldn't figure it out, but I think we, 2019 sounds good. There's 365 days there. They were here sometime within that time frame, but no, we had a chance to have them in. Uh, the work there is, uh, is a, just a gospel-centered work on the Word of God. Joe has some roots with uh, Bearing Precious Seed in Milford, Ohio. Uh, Amy is a uh, missionary's child, so... so uh, she is a MK or however you want to say that. Um, but their work together down there for six years has got a medical clinic. That, and Amy is a nurse and medical uh, background, uh, a Christian school. Uh, of course, their Sunday mornings are tremendous. They, they just, like few churches down there, have discipled people well enough where they have someone that takes the children, someone that takes the youth after they start together in worship. It was the Sunday time was just beautiful there. And thank you, God, for a time beyond measure. God uh, did some neat things in the sports camp. We did the sports camp Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the way, five days, all five days. And uh, the kids heard a Bible lesson every day. Friday was a, a different day, but they, uh, uh, and that Friday was kind of a, a bigger kind of a carnival setting with big games and everything like that but they were brought together after about an hour and a half and uh, Pastor Tomas preached the gospel a number of children made professions of faith that they received Christ at that time also too during the week there was a few different ones you need to you need to trap a couple of the team members that went I think uh, many of them might still be in bed but that's okay don't blame, I said many of them. I didn't say you, Crystal. You're still ready to go, girl. I said many, not all, see. You have to use your words carefully. But no, oh, Jennifer's here, yay! But there was some neat things that went on just individually with, tra with uh, translators and things like that. 
Let me just give you this one to kind of give you a perspective, which is, again, uh, we do a sports camp uh, last few years. Here's what happens. If you take something like this model, it's, it's just a simple model. It's the gospel. It's centered on the gospel, on God's kingdom, and God's people meshing with another culture of God's people and coming together as the body of Christ and going out and just ministering to children. While that's going on for three hours, there's a man by the name of Pastor Tomas. There's also Pastor Philo who helped in worship and also preached and taught the Word of God. And uh, Pastor Tomas is going to the moms and the dads. Mostly there was a lot of moms there and talking to them about Jesus. And I'm, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe there was 36 professions of faith, 36 Moms and dads get saved while the camp's going on. They know their kids are being taken care of. They trusted us with their children. That's only God. They allowed this man, Pastor Tomas, to open up the Bible, to use a gospel tract in their language, to talk to them about their salvation and their need for Jesus Christ. And you think of what could be going on or not going on for those three hours. Those children are getting Bible lesson just like here. They're learning scripture. First Corinthians chapter number 9, verses number 24 through 27. It was the theme of our first VBSC that we did out here. And the children were memorizing that, of course, in their, their Spanish language. And the workers that were working there with us, they would do that part. You can just imagine the kingdom of God work there. It's like Jesus Christ sitting them down and saying, hey, go feed them. We have a little lad here who has a little bit of lunch, and why don't you just go feed him? And uh, believe me, the last day we had, you know, 100-ish kids the first day, a little bit less the second, a little bit less the third, and then the fourth day there was probably 100-ish kids, and then the fifth day I think they heard something word of mouth. It wasn't like somebody sent out a group text, you know, I mean. And uh, there was probably, there was between 150 and 200 children there on the last day, and many of them, again, and hearing the gospel, a preaching message. So they were fed each day, which, you know, they, they were so thankful. They had a meal each day, a little something very simple, just like we do here. It wasn't actually like walking tacos or hot dogs like we do, but it was of their culture, just a simple little meal, a simple little snack. Uh, I thank God for you, church, for supporting missions, for praying for us, for uh, sending little goodie bags along the way with Bible verses in there and, and all that kind of stuff makes a difference in the Lord. And it really was a fruit-bearing time. Again, Joe and Amy are encouraged. And they're, they're doing it. They are uh, accomplishing God's assignment in God's work there in the mission field and uh, he will be back here to be with his home church in November for their Bible conference uh, it's a Grace Baptist and Lee Summit and uh, I don't know if we'll be able to have him over here he'll only be here a short time but uh, maybe we'll try we'll see how that works out but very thankful uh, again Wutulco Oaxaca Mexico that's a little bit easier Thank you, God. Thank you, church. Thank you, First Bible. Different people that were praying. And thank you, team. What an incredible time we had in the Lord. Uh, and uh, love never fails. I heard that love never fails. Go in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Chapter number one will be a little bit of review here. And we're going to be in chapter number two this morning. How are you feeling up there, BT? You doing all right? Oh, boy. The bathroom is not that far away in case you need it. You good? Amen. You might have taken four more emodiums. Oh, boy. Proud of you. That's my roommate up there. I went to bed. It was 72 degrees. I woke up. It was 62. He was trying to teach me how to be a little bit stronger in the Lord. Trust the Lord. So the second night, I made sure that I put a pullover on and some sweatpants. <laughs> that was making me strong in the Lord. And then... I was okay. He kind of bumped the temperature up a little bit, but that's another one of those pieces of going on a mission trip together with men and women in the Lord. It's really, really good. 
to build a closer relationship with your brothers and sisters in the Lord. And uh, there's something very special about that. Our theme verse for this series as we get into our Bible time today is found in verse number 8. It's up on the screen. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall fail. Charity did not fail in Oaxaca. God's love does not fail. G26 is God's love. The affection and benevolence, especially the feast of, or a feast of charity, to be dear to one, to love, to give goodwill. As it says in John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, and lay down his life for his friends. That's G26 in your concordance. If you looked up in John 13, 35, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. You have a love one for another. In so many other verses, that is G26. That is God's love that's put into the believer when you get saved. It's God's love. You just have to allow God to grow it in you. Or else, when you're first saved, it may stay that way for just, and it's just kind of this tiny little bit of love. And maybe sometimes it'll turn into that eros love, or it'll turn into that philo love, that eros physical or fleshly type of love, or that philo, that mental type of uh, uh, love. But really, this agape love that God gives us is what this is really based upon in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, 2, 3, all the way through 16, and that's what we're preaching on. Love never fails. Of course, when you think about, again, getting back to our study, and we're going to be in chapter number 2, I said I like to do a little review. My pages stick together when I use cough drops. You know, look at this. So don't rip those pages. But... Our first message, we had an introductory message, but then our second message, so I'll say that as June 5th, we did the first 17 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, and we spoke of division is not attractive, and you think in the Word of God, when you see this letter, the first seven, eight, nine verses, I mentioned this when I preached through it, that hey, he really is commending them. He thanks God always on their behalf. The grace of God that's given to you by Jesus. He's reminding them how the church got started in 52 AD, give or take. And you're thinking, wow, he's really just being kind, edifying, encouraging. I love that kind of letter. But then he gets into verse number 10 and says, now I beseech you, brother, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that you there be no divisions among you. And of course, we centered up on division is not attractive. I highlighted a couple other verses as we went into this message, and it went down to verse number 13. It's up on the screen. And 14, is Christ divided? What had happened? And Paul identified it because he got back there and heard that, hey, I'm better because Paul is the one who baptized me. I'm better because Cephas baptized me. He's saying, is Christ divided? No, it's all in Jesus and of Jesus. Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. Verse number 16 and 17, as we finished out our message on June 5th, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptize any other, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. You're going to hear that a little bit more today in chapter number 2, because Paul continually mentions and comes back to the gospel and Jesus Christ crucified, the preaching of the cross. So that was our first half of chapter number one after our intro. And then on June 12th, a couple of Sundays ago, we entitled our message, Tripped Up by Human Pride. Where did we go with this? Well, even verse number 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now the word wisdom, the word wise, they're being mentioned a great deal. Because Paul is going after this first initial key topic in this letter. He wants their attention. And I said, you know, I don't know why he did this. The more you read it, the more you study, you realize he's going after a key root of what causes a a church to become divided or filled up with human pride. And that's to say, you know what? I've got a little bit of God. 
I've got a little bit of the Bible. I've got a little experience. I've got a little knowledge. I've read things. I've listened to people teach, and, and I have my favorite little, little uh, podcast I listen to. And, and so I just mix that all up. I get this big pot, you know, big stew pot. I've used this illustration. I put a little Bible, a little me, a little God, a little this, a little that, a little church tradition. I stir it all up, and now I got this thing called me and my religion. And I get tripped up by my own human pride because all of us can get tripped up at one time or another. And he's saying, the preaching of the cross is the key piece of it. I put up there to highlight some of the verses that tie together to this message, and here it is. Verse number 27, but God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are not mighty. He continues in verse number 28, in the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Here it is. Verse number 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That was the strength of our word time a couple Sundays ago. Believers that have been seasoned in the word, they should be more humble than ever, more meek than ever. As you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, the fruit of the Spirit should grow in you. If it's lessening in you, then you're not growing in the Lord, you're growing in you. And Paul knew that that could happen to any church because it happened to this one, and he was there for 18 months. He was there with them when he centered everything up on the preaching of the cross. He hears word down in Ephesus, writes the note, the letter back there. Think about it. And we'll get to a passage in Ephesus to finish up our message. You're going, he wrote that one from prison. He wrote this one to Corinth. From, and there's some similar verbiage here. The Holy Spirit of God's telling them, look, I don't want any flesh to glory in his presence. No flesh, none of us should glory. It's interesting. It's interesting as I, I, I grow in the Lord a little bit here and I've been around a little bit here and there and I think, what is it about us that we sit around talking about all the things that we get from God? I talk about all this, oh, God did this and God did that. And you know what God did for me and God did for me? When is it going to flip around where we would say, instead of I have received from God such and such, what would it be like if I just said, this is what God received from me when I served him. He got my life, he got my attitude, he got my heart, he got my everything, and I gave it to him. He got my attention, he got my time, he got my treasure, he got everything from me when I went into this walk with the Lord thing. Instead of me saying, I need to get something from it. What did I get out of it? Paul says, no flesh should glory in his presence. Testify of the Lord and what he has done and use that language properly like Paul does. Use Paul's words because Jesus used these words to give his father glory. If Jesus gave his father glory and took no glory for himself, how would it be? But Paul follows the example of Jesus Christ. I give the glory to God. You know what God allowed me to do? God allowed me to. God, by his grace, allowed me to. God gave so much more than I have given him. That's the way that Paul speaks. That's the way that a godly person growing in the Lord grabs the word of God by the spirit of God and says, hey, I don't glory in anything but Jesus Christ. Verse 30, 31, then we'll start chapter 2. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Which, by the way, is a pretty good package. Verse number 31, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Because you know what? Our human pride can sneak up on us. We can become a little bit full of ourselves. Just as Paul saw. And Paul spoke to that same thing. Just think about 
how this chapter number two starts. We'll get there in one moment. You see, when it says love never fails, I'm thinking, okay, is this part of this wisdom piece? Yes. Is it part of how to deal with philosophy of man versus having a philosophy built on the love of wisdom of God's wisdom? Yes. Is the preaching of cross more preaching of the cross more important? Yes, because it equals the power of God. As we know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes it, to the Jew first and also the Greek. We know that. We know that 1 Corinthians 2 5, when we get there, it's going to talk about hey, I am not operating in my faith in the wisdom of men. But the power of God. The wisdom message continues from chapter number one into chapter number two. Look at the first two words in chapter number two in your Bible. And I. And I. The conjunction and is pretty important, I heard. It connects one thought to the next thought, and they are connected already. Paul's saying, and I, brethren making personal now, when I came to you, verse number one, chapter number two, we'll come back to the title here in a moment, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. There, there's that verbiage again. All I know is who I am in Jesus Christ. That's a good identity to have. Again, we'll get in there in a moment. So if the world is that messed up, and then the world messes up the church, example, Ephesus, Thessalonica, pretty good model church, but they were exhorted about what they saw in the kingdom, the church of Colossae, Galatia, the church of Galatia, there's a lot here as Paul's writing these letters, but the world itself needs to hear from us. And that's how when we take these first eight verses of chapter number two today and just talk through them for a few minutes and have a few simple lessons out of it, you're going to see that this title is really kind of what makes sense. We must warn the world. We must warn the world. We as the church must warn the world that they are messed up. That the world itself in its world system run by the prince of the power of this air is messed up. Messed up in its philosophy, messed up in its wisdom, messed up in its enticing words, messed up in its flesh and its foolishness. And God is clearly declaring it in chapter 1 and chapter number 2. And he's speaking of this wisdom part of God himself versus the wisdom of man. Let me remind you of what wisdom is very simply. Wisdom is the right use or exercise of knowledge, the choice of laudable ends, and the best means to accomplish them. So we must warn the world that their wisdom is wrong. How do you do that? In a godly way through the word of God. Just yelling and screaming at them and telling them that they, oh, you're so stupid, you don't know what you're talking about. It's not going to get you anywhere. We're talking about a spiritual issue here. We're talking about a lost soul here. And Paul the Apostle saying, Corinthian church, you need to get your act together back to Jesus Christ. The preaching of the cross is what we need to do, and you need the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of man. And then you can say, okay, let's go warn the rest of the world in the Corinthian area, the Corinth city that's full of Grecian people that definitely, truly worship other gods. I put up there also two from last week, and it's just uh, two weeks ago, wisdom broad and full of intelligence, used of knowledge of very diverse manners, matters. The wisdom which belongs to men is, it's solid. There's wisdom of man. But it's nothing compared to the supreme intelligence as it belongs to God, to Christ. The wisdom of God as evinced in forming and executed counsels and formations of how the scriptures were already put together. And then there's this other part that's tied together with wisdom, and that's philosophy, the love of wisdom. You know what? That's something that can be solid if it's the love of the wisdom of God. But oftentimes, literally, the love of wisdom turns into this, well, 
I love the wisdom of how the world does science. I love the wisdom of how the world does their mathematics. I love how they do creation and how they do history and rewrite things and how they have this philosophy of the ways to live. As the Bible teaches us in Colossians 2, 8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. The love of wisdom, the love of God's wisdom. In modern acceptation, Philosophy is a general term denoting an explanation of the reason of things. Again, Strong's G5385, love of wisdom, used either of zeal for or a skill of any art or science, any branch of knowledge. Do you know what your children are being taught in schools? I'm not talking about you homeschooling them or going to a Christian school. Joe and Amy have a Christian school in Oaxaca. He told me I'd like to have another one start in this little area where they're doing the, uh, the church plant off of the main church. Even in six years, a church plant with the idea of doing another church plant after that. He said, I need to get a Christian school going so that we can touch their lives on a frequent basis, on a daily basis. They also had a connection into a private school, a little school in that area where a lot of the kids went to that school. And God opened up a door and gave favor to Joe and Amy to be able to visit that school on Friday. They invited him. And invited him, her and us as a team, and we passed out Super Libro. Does everybody know what that is? Super book. There you go. It's a Bible book for little children. What I'm saying is that's where they're being taught things that may be the philosophy of man, the philosophy of this world. You see, again, when you see this idea of love never fails and you transcend it into Paul's writings from the Holy Spirit of God, you realize Paul loved this church. Paul cares about the people there. Do we care about the God's church and this church? Yes, you do. Then today as we head into this big challenge for the next few minutes, that's really good for all of us. It comes to a place where we recognize that Paul has agape love for these people. And he knows that that love never fails to the brethren of the Corinthian church. When I think again of we must warn the world, I take that upon myself to realize that it'd be pretty tough for you and I to warn the world if we're stuck in the world. If we live upon the philosophy of man instead of the philosophy of God, we can be fooled and we can be duped we need to spend more time in the Word of God. We need to spend more time looking at what God has to say because it's easy to spend one, two, three, four, five weeks just listening to the messaging of the world you're living in and it will twist your mind and now think about the wisdom of man instead of the wisdom of God being preeminent in your life. It may not even be something you're aware of until you go, whoa. I just read the proverb of the day, and I can see that a lot of my behavior is conflicted with God's word. I just read 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, chapter number 2, chapter number 3, chapter number 4. I'm reading through the book. Of, hey, listen, you want, I don't know where to read this week, read this month. Why don't you read 1 Corinthians along with us and read it through and see what Paul's doing so that you personally can say, wow, how can I warn the world? I need to get a perspective from God. Well, I just have four simple little things I want to show you. So let's read these verse eight, eight verses, and then I'll show them to you one after another as we study this chapter a little bit more, go half the chapter. Verse number one, I already spoke of and I. Here's your conjunction to tie chapter one to chapter number two. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I know we read that earlier. Doesn't that just tell you this man and the way he thinks? This is, and this kind of statement and verbiage is in a lot of his letters, a lot of his teaching. I'm nothing more than who I am in Jesus Christ. Verse 3. 
And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, man's wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Verse 6. How be it? How be it then? How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect? Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, but come to naught, that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God and the mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Wow. We'll get into that here in a moment. Think about that passage. If the princes of this world, hey, hey, the leaders are supposed to be the wisest people in God's kingdom on this earth, a reflection of his kingdom in heaven. He is saying, look, you princes, Jewish leaders, you're supposed to know the things of God. The prophets and the angels were sent to speak to them, and yet God made sure it was a mystery. God made sure they didn't get it completely, even though they were preaching the Messiah, preaching the coming of Jesus, preaching the second coming. Of They're preaching it in the Old Testament, yet they can't even really explain this mystery. Would you like to come up and teach us on mysteries, Brian? You've been doing that a little bit in discipleship hour? We'll be here in a moment. You see, consider this. God's plan was ordained and purpose-filled from the very beginning, yet man didn't know. God orchestrated everything to the point when Jesus came. Everything was set in place, and yet man didn't have a clue. Yet there was prophets that were preaching God's word, yet they really didn't know what they were saying. They didn't even have a complete understanding because it's a mystery until Jesus showed up. And then Jesus on the cross, and the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, and the preaching of the cross, and you understand what he's saying. It always was a mystery until Jesus came. You see, church this morning, the church at Corinth, Corinth, at Corinth is getting, again, another teaching setting from Paul the Apostle, the teacher. And that was his model. He followed Jesus' model. Why is it we're always looking again? I say it often. Why are we looking for new models? If Jesus used a certain model that came from on high, it's divine, and then Paul, the greatest believer and follower of Jesus Christ in our New Testament and understanding anything, he followed Jesus' model. How is it that we're always looking for another way to go? In Matthew 28, it says, Go ye therefore to all the world, preach the gospel. I mean, excuse me, teach all nations, baptizing them. Well, what did Paul do? Paul in Acts 18, he came to Corinth, Many heard and believed. They were baptized, and he was there for a year and six months. He taught the word of God, and then he said, I am with thee. What did Jesus Christ do? Jesus says, go ye therefore. Teach all nations, baptizing them. Sound familiar? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And lo, I will be with you always. Again, God's love never fails. That's Paul's love. We need to warn the world. So watch this. Very simply, four tiny little lessons in the midst of our scripture that help us really grasp how to warn the whole world. But we get the warning first. Church, we get the warning first so then we can warn the world. The first one is identity fraud. Where do we get that from? The world does not testify of God's testimony. Look here. He says in verse number one, declaring unto you the testimony of God. I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's the testimony of God and him. He told Timothy, remember the testimony of the Lord in you. The world does not testify testify of God's testimony. Follow this just for a second. Before somebody does fraudulent activity to your identity, they have to steal it. Anybody had their identity stolen before? It's more common. What happens then? Fraudulent activity. 
that person that's do, doing it, they have another one and another one and another identity, and then they just keep on going. They don't even know who they are. They're just fraudulent after they steal them. This is the world you live in. People don't even know who they are. They have identity fraud in their lives. That's the world that Paul is speaking to as he's trying to get this church in Corinth to go, you get saved out of that world. You have an identity in Jesus Christ. Him crucifies all your identity. How about if you went up to one of your brothers and sisters in the Lord and remember, your identity is in Jesus Christ. You're born again, yes. I don't remember when I came, I came to the saving knowledge. My life was changed. I knew I was forgiven. I, I know it. I, I, maybe I'm not that way. I'm not that where the, I should be right now. And say, how about if you just said, you know what? Your identity is in Jesus Christ. You don't have to have identity fraud and be confused like the world. Because the world will change their identity every week, every month, every year according to what fits them. Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians supports this idea of having your testimony in the Lord. For our rejoicing, for excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, it's up on the screen. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. Because of the grace of God, our conversation or our way of behavior is in him. Their identity is in him. He's speaking that in the second letter to the church at Corinth. Paul says this is how to identify. Identify with God. The testimony of God through the Lord Jesus Christ is who you are. You don't have to be in a place where you're wondering what your identity is. And once you're settled in that place and you're growing in the grace and knowledge and growing and growing and you know Jesus Christ is my Savior, my Lord, my Master, my God in heaven. He's my Father, and I love Him, and I will follow after His will. I will read the Word of God, and I will study it, and I will ask people to teach me, disciple me, mentor me, whatever, in the Word. Then the identity fraud that you once were messing with goes away, and now you can warn the world that does not testify, testify of God's testimony. The second one, impotent failure. That means a powerless life of failure. The world does not know God's power at all. They think they do. They manufacture it. I'm tough. I can handle it. I'm working on it. How many lost people are working on it? Do you have a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ? What do you think about Jesus? What is your thought about God? Do you recognize that he exists? Well, sure. I'm glad that he made me. He gave me this life. Do you realize that you do not breathe one single breath without his power allowing you to do it? It says in chapter number 2, verse number 3, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. That doesn't mean that Paul says, I can't breathe. He's saying, I have no strength unless it's in him. I come and I preach. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. That's when I came and preached, verse 4, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the life-changing power of the word of God from the gospel, the spirit and the power. The world doesn't have a clue about that power. Now here's the funny part about enticing words. We're always trying to find the exact little word that has to work. It's one thing to answer people. And I know some of you are learned in so many areas to be able to answer people's questions. But you guys know. You ladies know. It's going to be the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God that's going to save a soul. That's the only one that's going to do it. Well, if I just say it a certain way, just ask Jesus into your heart. We've got to be careful of these enticing words. Paul didn't use enticing words. You know what the word enticing means? Persuasive words. Let me have you believe something that I can convert you. You can't convert anybody to Jesus Christ. You can't save any soul. You don't have that kind of power. But how is it that somehow we get twisted up into that? 
It says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. So he's beseeching in his second letter to the church at Corinth by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, but be an absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some. I don't want to be in the way which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Oh, you know everything, don't you, Paul? He had to war against that constantly. It was a message, messenger from Satan that showed up in his life. You think about how God wants us to operate to warn the world. It is not with your enticing words because the world does not know God's power, but they have to experience the power of God through the word of God that comes out of your lips by the Spirit. You and I can't just go and rehearse a bunch of things and say, oh, I just need to say the exact thing and everything will work. Charles Purgeon said this, the power that is in the gospel does not lie in the eloquence of the preacher. Otherwise, men would be the converters of souls. Nor does it lie in the preacher's learning. Otherwise, it would consist in the wisdom of men. We might preach until our tongue rotted, till we exhaust our lungs and die. But never a soul would be converted unless the Holy Spirit be with the word of God to give it the power to convert the soul. That's it. That's it. Romans 5.10 says, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It's him. Powerful. Powerful. Number three, little lesson here. Incomplete faith. Besides the identity fraud and the impotent failure, there's incomplete faith that the world has to be warned about. The world does not trust God's message. They do not trust God's message. The world doesn't want to trust God's message. The world is totally against God's message. That's why they keep on coming up with different ones. We need to warn them. This incomplete faith, verse number five, I mentioned it earlier, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul's aim simply was to tell you and I, hey, your faith is in the power of God. The world says, <laughs> it's in the power of me, or an ulterior message. I can do enough works to get myself to fit into God's good grace. If I can just, and if I could just, and if I could just, I, 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 I. The world is all about I, I, I. And we have to be careful that in our faith walk with the Lord, that it is of course, complete in Jesus. You are, you are complete and one day perfected into him. But if you keep away from the word of God long enough, then your faith will be unsettled. Your faith will be ungrounded. And then you can be fooled by philosophy, vain deceit. You and I have to understand what Paul's conveying to the church and then be able to take this challenge and say, okay, I can go warn the world. I need to warn the world that they need to trust God's message. They need to grab a hold of God's power. And it's all centered on Jesus Christ. They need a testimony of God through Jesus Christ. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 13, verses 4 and 5, For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Verse number five, examine yourselves, you and I, examine yourselves, whether we be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? That's not on me. I've got to deal with me. You need to deal with you. When Paul asked this question of the church, he's asking it in the spirit and so the Spirit of God's asking us. For though he was crucified through weakness, he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God.
toward you as believers. That's how that agape love comes out. That's how that love never fails. So examine yourself. We need to examine ourselves, <laughs> whether we be in the faith. Because the world has. They're in a place where they just will not, will not trust the message of God and his power. Lastly, our fourth little mini lesson out of our scripture, irreversible fatality. If someone dies without Jesus Christ, we know that they do not bow their knee and bow their heart to God and call in the name of the Lord to save them. If we do not, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's the work of God. Excuse me, not by work. See, Roger, you knew that I would do that. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves as the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation, that's what reverses the irreversible fatality when someone is lost and they will not, they will not get saved. It's irreversible. The world does not believe God's wisdom. They don't. They don't believe God's message. They don't believe that God's wisdom in the mystery is really Jesus Christ. Verse 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. I spoke of that a little bit earlier. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. God ordained it all. Turn to the Ephesians chapter number 3 and I'll finish there. God, again, as I said earlier, ordained and orchestrated everything. He determined exactly the way it was to be. And for the world to say, I don't believe God's wisdom. I don't believe that he could put that thing together. I don't believe in the mystery of God. I don't believe in what the word of God says. That's what basically someone's saying is, I will not believe in God's word. We need to warn the world. We need to warn them that God's word is true. Every word of it. We need to. But in order to do that and have it be effective, we need to believe it too. Maybe the church has gotten to a point where we don't believe God's wisdom. God's lying to us. God's word, I don't know. I guess I can believe it when it happens to work out for me. God's wisdom is to be believed every single word of it. There's no, well, I'm not so sure about that passage if it really applies to me. I'm not so sure about the mystery. I'm not really so sure about that. It's so deep. It's so difficult. It's so hard. Well, we'll get into that next week when it comes to the discerning of the word of God and whether or not the Holy Spirit of God in you is really the one or you think, I can mentally figure this stuff out. It's the Spirit of God that teaches you the Word of God when you're converted. It says in Ephesians chapter number 3, I put up a couple of the verses, start at verse number 3 and 4. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four in a few words whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his apostles, holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and of the same body and partakers of his prom promise in Christ by the gospel. Paul is really cranking it up. He's warming it up. He's showing that this mystery of Jesus Christ is also before all the Gentiles as well. It is a mystery that could not be in any way, shape, or form understood until Jesus Christ came and Jesus Christ went to the cross and the preaching of the cross. To them that is lost, there it's foolishness. He says in verse number 7, Wherefore, I was made a minister, a steward, a caretaker, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, 
who am less than the at least of all saints is this grace given. Do you remember the same man that said, very humbly speaking, in chapter number 2, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is Paul saying, I am nothing. I have nothing except for Jesus Christ. I am the least of all the saints. That I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. God's wisdom formulated the mystery of Jesus Christ crucified, raised from the dead to be available for redemption to the Jew, the Greek, the Gentile. That's a mystery that, as the prophets preached it years ago, they just preached what they were told to preach. And it says here in verse number 20 and 21 to finish it up, to the intent that now into the principalities, powers, heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, the world rejects, the world will not believe God's wisdom. God says it's for my church. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. We need to warn the world that their wisdom that they have It's an irreversible fatality, spiritually speaking. We finish up with this statement and question as we go into the Lord's Supper. What hinders us as God's wisdom-filled witnesses to warn the world? Is it that we don't have the courage, the strength, or maybe we're kind of hung and half and half, I'm saved, born again, but I'm not so sure if I, when you and I have the testimony of the Lord in our lives, we know that we have the power of God in Jesus Christ, we know we have the wisdom of God and we believe it, we trust in the message of God completely, we have that as the Bible believing people that we are, we're the wisdom filled people, then hey, what's hindering us from warning the world? As we come to the Lord's Supper, let us remember the world needs God's salvation. And it's the power of God, not the wisdom of man. Let's bow for a word of prayer. As the music plays in the background for the Lord's Supper, let me pray with you and pray for you. And as you come to get the elements here in a little bit, and you come and sit down in your chair afterwards, um, I just want you to think about that a little bit. What's hindering you and me? And maybe today, as you remember what Jesus has done for you, you remember that the world needs God's salvation. We need to be reminded all the time. Father in heaven, thank you for your precious word that you've preserved all these centuries. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit to be the teacher. And I thank you most of all for the saving grace of Jesus Christ and him crucified. I know nothing else. Save Christ crucified. Thank you, Jesus, for being our all in all. You're my identity. You're the believer's identity. You're all of our blood. All the believers have identity in you. We don't have to be fraudulent. I pray for this, this time in your Lord's, in this uh, communion time in the Lord's Supper, that it will be really precious unto you and precious unto each one of us because it's something we give to you as you give to us. We give you the glory and the honor. We search our hearts we realize that we need to remember that this world needs to be warned before an irreversible fatality happens. Lord, bless our time again in our Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name, amen.